The book is really a collection of stories that were published between 1930 and 1938. And these are stories that my family has had copies of, known about, some of which have been republished since the 30s, one in an Alberta um, school reader on Alberta comedy or Alberta humor, I think it was. And it seemed to me that all these stories together would make an interesting collection. They're, they're just enough to provide a window into that early period in the first third or so of the 20th century when Banff was already established as a town, had been there a while, but was becoming a big tourist center and guiding and hunting in the area around Banff were still allowed because the National Park hadn't expanded very much yet. And so an odd combination of things were going on. Uh, was, uh, this strange combination of things with um, National Park, tourism, but also right beside it, hunting, fishing, and activities that just aren't possible in national parks now or in anywhere near Banff, for that matter, either. So the, the story uh, is, is really a story of a particular person who was both a guide and, and hunter on the one hand and turned out to be a bit of a writer or a humorist on the other hand. And when his business dried up at the be beginning of the Depression, uh, his, uh, his talent, his other talent came to the fore and he wrote these stories about his experiences since 1906 when he first arrived in Banff. Uh, and so in 1930, he was looking back on 24 years of guiding, working for the Brewsters, uh, guiding um, uh, Mary Vox, Walcott, and guiding other people, uh, mainly tourists, not scientists. <coughs> he had a certain, a certain reputation. Uh, it was based partly on his skill and partly on his legendary drinking abilities. And so he was a local character of sorts. And that's one of the things that made the, the uh, stories appealing, I think, to the American readership uh, who read these stories in the 30s. He sold these stories to American glossy sporting magazines, which is where his clients came from largely, from, from New York City and from Boston, from, uh, from the East Coast. We didn't just include the Tex Woods stories. We also included an article that Nello Vernon Wood wrote as his so-called straight self. Um, that was to do with the first ski ascent of Mount Ptarmigan and that was published in the Canadian Alpine Journal if I'm right and so uh, 1932 and uh, that's that is the tone of that piece is very different from the others uh, he's very serious he's very accurate about what he's doing and he was a very complex man as well uh, he was a lifelong uh, guardian subscriber a social democrat he married a working class Irish woman from, 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 from rural Ireland uh, whom he met when she was working as a chambermaid at the Banff Springs Hotel. He was a complex person in private life and then his persona as, as guide in these stories is also quite complex and layered with different voices and different social registers and different literary and, and vernacular registers, all of which again make for uh, something that needs explaining rather than just presenting. He retained a British accent all his life. There are tapes from the 1960s in which he's, uh, you know, he speaks for hours and hours with a middle, a middle class, upper middle class, Midlands accent uh, of the late 19th century with a very whistly S. The timing is really interesting. He starts mm -hmm. to, the, his first story is published in 1930. The stock market had just crashed a year earlier and his clients were typically brokers, bankers, lawyers from New York and from Boston. And clearly his trade had dried up. And that summer he went hungry, as it were. He had children, a number of children, uh, to feed. And uh, so his first story appears in 1930. I, it can't be coincidence. There's, and there's no record of anything appearing before that time or of his having submitted stories. He might have done, we don't know. In 1938, suddenly, his, his stories dry up and it's in 38 that he moves permanently from Banff to the bench lands above uh, Invermere in British Columbia. So crosses the Continental Divide, moves away from the burgeoning park 
atmosphere that the this and a new tourist world that didn't include hunting and, and fishing, certainly not in the park. Uh, and and he set up a, a kind of dude ranch, and camp summer camp for boys, who not surprisingly also came from the same families in Boston and New York, uh, uh, who, whom he had guided uh, in the in the tens and twenties. Uh, so, uh, the I think the end of his writing coincides with his move out of Banff and um, also the beginning of a new economic period. By 1938, the economy wasn't exactly roaring, but it had certainly recovered somewhat from the worst, uh, the worst depths of the, de of the Depression. And he, by that time, he had people, he had another generation even, the sons of his previous clients now coming west uh, to learn how to ride and so on and so forth. The mood of, certainly in Canada and, and, uh, and also in the United States, especially on the eastern seaboard, is changing. Um, you know, and attitudes to tourism and to travel are changing too because the war is beginning to come closer. And within a year, Canada is going to be involved in that war, right? 1939 is when Canada is officially involved in it. And there are a lot of social changes that happened in Canada at that time. Uh, Texas stories would have seemed very folksy. And, and, fr and frivolous. And frivolous by that time and may not have been appealing to the same market. And so it is also possible, although Tex or Nello Vernon Wood himself does not say this, that his market was disappearing and, and he even may have felt that there was nothing left to say um, because uh, the social environment was changing. We have to speculate a little bit about that because we can't talk to him about how that really worked. But uh, that would, those factors would have to be there, just as the stock market crash in the United States would have to have affected uh, Texas' livelihood and his decision to become a writer.